Thank you very much. Um, what I'm going to be talking about today are paradigms, are sets of ideas that influence our thinking. And there is absolutely no doubt that prevailing paradigms uh, influence how we undertake environmental management. I'm going to start when I was a master's student in the early 1980s, when in thinking about uh, coastal management, uh, thinking was dominated by coastal hazards. And I don't know how many versions of this formula I saw as a student, uh, the coastal hazard zone formula, where a line was drawn on a map. And we still see elements of that around today. Then, uh, after the Rio summit in 1992, integrated coastal zone management became the, the buzz term and, and the way things were thought about. And I'm not going to go over what it is, we all know about those things, but I just want to highlight the last two uh, sentences on this side, on this slide, where there has been a lot of literature around saying that, well, it's a great idea, but it hasn't really worked. Maybe it's just too complicated. Um, this last one, the participative bottom-up approach of contemporary European ICZM, ineffectual and uh, unsustainable. Then with climate change, we went to adaptation as a paradigm. And uh, right around the world, we find organisations within government set up to undertake and coordinate coastal adaptation approaches. And in many ways, I think we are, are still in this paradigm today. Um, what underlies these different paradigms is one theme, and that relates to property rights. Uh, underlying these themes are the right to protect property, uh, private property rights versus public property rights, and also what, uh, what, who is going to pay for, for these things, and indeed, just the right to protect property. And I'm just going to use a very quick example of seawalls, which I think uh, indicates the problem of all these paradigms quite nicely. Um, most places have an entrenched right to protect your private land, but we also want to protect our coastlines for private uses. And where coasts are eroding, these two views of the world, or our views of coasts, are entirely incompatible. And I use this cartoon just to show that. Here we've got a plan view and a profile view of beaches with property behind it. And one of the owners uh, exercises a right to build a seawall. And uh, you can see that case in the middle. Well, if this is an eroding coast, what happens? Uh, on the top and the bottom, we see the beach just retreating. In the middle, we see the profile retreating, which where the seawall is simply results in the level of the beach going down. Um, so what we end up with is a beach at the top and bottom, but in a different location, in the middle, we end up with no beach at all. That's just how it works. We all know that. And uh, we often hear the term beach protection, but what is beach protection? It's not beach protection, but asset protection. Um, a, just a, a very quick local example of that. Here we see a seawall looking after a building. And what I want to point out here is that in this location, people can still go and use the beach. Here, they will get wet if they try to lie on the beach and sunbathe. So most of us agree that if a beach is eroding, a properly built seawall will protect assets, and I emphasize properly built there. Um, few countries have the resources in the light of what's going to happen into the future of protecting large amounts of coastline anyway, and beaches will remain healthy in the future if they are allowed to be ambulatory or are allowed to move. So let's just return to the Gulf of Finland. And I just highlight this book that came out a few years ago now. And first of all, Finland, what problem? Um, it is interesting to me that Finland is the only country in Europe that's not represented in that book. Um, and I think for very good reason. Um, I'm not trying to uh, downplay issues that they have, but with hard, generally hard coasts, and still a little bit of isostatic uplift, the problem is certainly a lot less than many other countries face. In terms of Russia, I admit that I don't know very much about the Russian Gulf of Finland, and I certainly would welcome um, collaboration uh, on that. But in Estonia, uh, I think the situation right now is quite good uh, because of tradition of not building near the coast, its history, or uh, an act, the Nature Conservation Act, which in my opinion is a very good one, 
Coastal buffers or setbacks are generally large, but I will suggest that this may be changing. Why is this? Well, there's been a lot written on history, and of course, um, during the period 40s through 90s, the coastal zone was very much a no-go zone in terms of uh, certain activities, and you will find a, a number of papers in the literature exploring that. But the result uh, is that the coastal strip is relatively devoid of structures. Uh, and when I came to Estonia first a few years back, uh, this made me very happy indeed. Um, we also have the, Gulf of, uh, the Baltic Greenbelt Initiative, part of the European Greenbelt Initiative. Um, it's there, but there's not a lot of formal application that I've found in the planning process. Uh, but moving on a bit and looking as a bit of an outsider here, uh, many countries and people look with envy at places that, for whatever reason, have a largely undeveloped coastal area with wide setbacks. And Estonia is certainly, right now, one of these. But in the last week or so, there have been some unfortunate, in my opinion, uh, developments. And this is just a translation of an article that, that appeared in a number of the newspapers uh, in Estonia over the last few days. Now, um, the Nature Conservation Act 2004 in Estonia uh, has established in the coastal area very wide setbacks. On a world scale, these are very wide setbacks from 200 metres in some areas, 100 metres in some areas, and this explains that situation that I just mentioned. But just earlier this month, a bill was signed, that doesn't mean it's law, it's, ju it's just starting a process of consideration, that would leave only a 20-metre protection zone uh, everywhere in Estonia, which can be altered by local governments. Now, to me, this is not the time, with future climate change, sea level rise, and other things that are going on, to even be considering such a change. And uh, we certainly must uh, use the historical advantages that exist, given the country's history, and given what may have been a, a a very fortunate passing of an act uh, a number of years ago. Now, returning to paradigms, um, we have seen some successes in coastal management, but we keep trying to integrate, reconcile, and adapt, and I'm going to suggest that it's time for a paradigm shift. Um, this is the sustainability model, this is the model that I'm going to go into. Now, I just want to point out that there are other people uh, thinking this way, or thinking in different ways. And I just point out this book by our colleague Anders Omstadt. Um, it's not a rights of nature approach, but if you haven't seen that book, I would really encourage you to have a look at it, because Anders in this has really uh, just tried to introduce a different way of thinking about coastal management. I don't necessarily agree with everything he says, but it's great to see these scientists, well-respected scientists, now starting to think in different ways. Now, I do want to promote, or at least get you thinking about, the Earth, Jurispru Earth Jurisprudent <laughs> Jurisprudence, Prudence, sorry, Rights of Nature approach, which started appearing in the literature in the 2010s. And it's a legal theory that describes environments of, as having inherent legal rights. Um, and uh, it uh, is now reasonably well established in a number of places. Uh, a number of countries now have laws that, in part, encompass these views. Um, and uh, the one that I'm most familiar with is the case in New Zealand of a river. It's the Whanganui River, uh, that in legislation, for legal purposes, is now a person. This is the idea behind the rights of nature approach. Now, you can see that, that this approach is entering the scientific literature um, as well, uh, but it's mainly involved in the management and the legal uh, aspects of this particular river. And this picture here, from a legal perspective, is a picture of the river. That there is the river from a legal perspective. She is one of two, in fact, guardians that represent the rights of the river in the legal system, a, a different way of thinking about things. Now, in Europe, the rights of nature approach is quite new. And uh, 2019, an initial conference, and two 
reports here sponsored by different elements of the European Union. So the thoughts are there, but it hasn't really progressed uh, very far at all. So instead of a summary, I'm going to ask some summary questions. Firstly, is there a way forward for coastal, uh, for coastal spatial planning that goes about this approach of trying to integrate knowledge, integrate view viewpoints, or do we really need to make a fundamental change in the way we think about things? How do we ensure the maintenance of historical and natural advantages where they exist? We can't go backwards, and I, I'm, I'm afraid that there, are some foot, there is some thinking in Estonia right now where that is st maybe starting to happen. Quite specifically, should a beach insert your favourite type of environment have legal right to exist, function, migrate, even when its functioning uh, infringes on private property rights? Does the environment itself have those rights over the rights of ownership? And I'm not suggesting it necessarily is, but is the rights of nature approach a possible way forward here? That's all I want to say. Thank you very much. <laughs>